Hello and welcome to the Blue Room Live vlog. This is the live forum where 25 Perth theatre artists have been invited to share their views on live arts and theatre in Perth. Tonight's blogger is David Milroy. Please welcome him. Thank you very much. It's a huge crowd here tonight. Um, I am David Milroy. I'm a uh, playwright. I wear a couple of hats, but I'm also a chairperson of a native title group, which is uh, Balgu people from the East Pilbara. So uh, a great deal of my time is spent in La La Land writing plays and dreaming of different things. And the other part of my life is dealing with some of the realities of native title in Western Australia. Uh, native title in the East Pilbara is often centred around iron ore, um, recently uranium, and many other sorts of minerals. So it gives me a great deal of angst, and, uh, which keeps my writing, it sort of feeds my writing, I guess. Um, I think Western Australia is one of the most wonderful places to live on earth, um, especially as a writer, because I still see it as the Wild West in many ways. We have uh, many characters, many stories, and quite an amazing landscape. I believe uh, the West Australian landscape is a very spiritual landscape, and that's just not from a an Aboriginal perspective, but I think uh, many non-Indigenous people who have had the privilege of travelling through this landscape would have felt that spiritual spirituality that's attached to this country. I think when you travel through the country, um, sometimes the country travels through you and you have a certain feeling for it. And uh, a lot of uh, non-Indigenous people often struggle with uh, who we are in this place, what is our history, what is our connection if we're not Indigenous. But I think if you have that sort of feeling, <clears throat> it's a good start to actually understanding who we are in Western Australia, regardless of your cultural background. Um, with my writing, that is something that I draw upon often. Um, it gives me a deep sense of who I am and where I belong in this landscape. Um, I also think that um, <clears throat> many West Australian writers um, have a unique style because of what they draw upon, what they get from the country. I think if you, uh, if you go over east, you don't really, that's when you really start understanding what Western Australian writing is when you read works like Tim Winton's works and that sort of connection to country. It's quite amazing and I think it's something that when I was in Sydney for three years I couldn't wait to get back to Western Australia, back to the Wild West where you get those sorts of feelings and inspirations from. Now, <clears throat> how I got involved in theatre? Well, it wasn't until in my 30s that I actually even saw a theatre show. Um, I think the only theatre that I'd seen prior to that was uh, some little dancing poodles with tutus on at the Manning Hall. Um, it was probably, Jeff Kelso was probably sitting next to me because we both grew up in the same suburb on the edge of this swamp. And um, I've often talked to him about that smell of that swamp and the methane. And I think that's what did something to our brains and that's why we wound up in theatre. But <clears throat> I was a musician for many years and then I got involved in theatre quite by accident because I was doing some, in the early to mid 80s, doing some shows for Black Swan, just doing music. Then um, a small theatre company that was under the umbrella of Barking Gecko was doing a, a youth theatre project um, called Yuri Arkin, trying to involve Aboriginal youth in theatre and they asked me to do some music. So I got involved doing some music and then just as I was going to go on tour with this play called Wicked, written by an Aboriginal writer called Michael Smith, um, one of the actors won $1.4 million in Lotto and so they were short of an actor. So they said, can you act? And I said, well, not really. And then they told me how much they were paying and I said, I can do anything. <coughs> and uh, I sort of, I didn't tell them that the only theatre I'd seen prior to that was the Dancing Poodles, but um, it didn't matter. So I went on tour and that's how I got involved in theatre. Um, and it was a really a big journey of discovery through the Pilbara. The main thing I discovered was that I couldn't act, but when I came back, I got involved in Yuri Arkin. And in the, in the mid 80s, um, Aboriginal theatre wasn't really done by Aboriginal people. Um, I sort of labelled it really as puppet theatre. You know, there weren't Aboriginal many Aboriginal writers. Um, there certainly, to my knowledge back then, weren't any Aboriginal directors in Western Australia um, and certainly no stage managers. The, across the board there was very few Aboriginal people involved other than being on stage, so it was sort of a, a sense of puppet theatre and a lot of the works weren't, weren't actually written by Aboriginal writers either. That's not to say that there weren't Aboriginal writers producing works. Um, so Yuri Arkham was a great vehicle at that time to 
to challenge some of those notions of what, what actually is Aboriginal theatre and what are the stories that the community actually wants to tell. Um, <clears throat> so from this little youth theatre project, I got involved full time with the company and with Lynette Narkle and Paul McPhail, we started saying, well, what are the stories we would tell if we were to, to do it on main stage? And what was really quite evident then was that <clears throat> there seemed to be, in Western Australia and Australian consciousness, no understanding of what Aboriginal history was, what Aboriginal people had been through, what, where we'd come from, who, who are these strange people on the landscape that, that seem to get in trouble and wind up in jail. Um, so we started, just had a dreaming session, I guess you'd call it, where we sat down and said, well, what are we going to write about? And we basically were going to tell our own stories about our own families and our own friends. So I said I wanted to tell a story about my mate called Jeff Narkle, who uh, was a tent, tent boxer, grew up on the missions, got into tent boxing. And Lynette wanted to tell a story about Arnie Dot, um, the Davis family and, and their life and growing up, those sorts of stories. Um, I wanted to do a play called Run Amuck about what it was like touring up through the Northwest and through the Kimberley in, in Aboriginal bands and basically running amuck. Um, so we, we wrote up a whole program without ever having written a play and we actually got funding to do it, amazingly enough. And then we sat down and said, damn it, now we've got to write these plays. So it was like um, a baptism of fire. So we put pen to paper and I guess that was the birth of the company. We started producing these works. Uh, one of the plays, the Jeff Narkle one, was a play called King Hip. So <clears throat> the inception of that play was, say, 1986, 1987. And that was basically a play about stolen, stolen generations. Um, of course, this is many, many years before that phrase had even been termed, in, and it wasn't even in the Australian consciousness. So I guess what we were struggling to do was to actually tell the true history of Australia. And later on, I guess I, I labelled that as, as catch-up theatre. Um, the sort of role that we were performing was um, catch-up theatre. We were trying to bring into the consciousness of the community and, and Australians about what had actually happened to Aboriginal people, what were our stories. Um, interestingly enough, oh, I see those. <laughs> interestingly, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, when I was in America, I was, I was fortunate to, to be to America a few times at the American Playwrights Conference, and. Uh, and I, was, I had the opportunity to talk to some Afro-American theatre writers and they talked about similar, similar history in, in a way in the 60s how their theatre was suddenly very popular because people wanted to hear what Afro-Americans were, were, what their history was from their eyes and their perspective. And they said, but be very careful because what happens once, once it get, gets to a certain point, a point where they say, we've had enough, we don't want to hear it anymore. So what, what we did was we had to start thinking of new ways of doing theatre and try to find ways that we can get Aboriginal audiences uh, and white audiences to sit in the same theatre and connect, connect on the same level. Because what was happening, we were having um, white people often saying, I don't get it, and Aboriginal people just cracking up laughing and no one really feeling particularly comfortable. So I guess um, in recent years, um, there's been a desire to sort of keep our theatre fresh and find new ways of telling stories and contemporary ways of telling stories and also focus a little bit more on the universal things that we all share as people. And uh, I guess that's been my journey of late. And I think in Western Australia, we have such a, a unique opportunity to forge ahead in the next few years to develop this sort of a theatre that engages all West Australians on a, on a more even dialogue and a platform that we can all share and, and come together. I know it sounds a bit like reconciliation, but I see it as a bit more than that. I think it's, um, it's, it's something that the Western Australian landscape, when I talked about the spirituality that we can get through that, I think if we can get back to that and we get a sense of that from this place, that that's where the fantastic works of Western Australia are still going to keep coming out of. And uh, we'll be able to have maybe a really worldwide, unique style of theatre that, that blends all sorts of um, feelings and aspirations and, and amalgamation of writers and companies. And I think it's an exciting time to live and I, I, I'm looking forward to the next five years. Thank you.